right, this morning we continue in the Gospel of Matthew, and uh, uh, and you, you know I, I prefer to preach uh, verse by verse, uh, and uh, so we're slowly going through the Gospel of Matthew, um, and I, I like to uh, try to not leave any stone uh, unturned, and uh, so that's what we're doing. I trust that you have uh, all a reading, uh, reading plan, a reading program uh, at home, and where you read the scriptures through. Um, you know, it's a person can boast that they can read the Bible in one year. If you can do that, great. But uh, there's nothing in scripture that commands us to read the scriptures in one year, right? And so some people, they really think highly of that. Well, yeah, it's a great thing to do if you can. But uh, I would rather uh, instruct uh, you know, Christians to read the scriptures you know, well, uh, read it through slowly, and you may spend a lot of time in one book of the scriptures with maybe a, uh, a commentary or something to help you understand certain things, like the book of Revelation. That's difficult to understand. <laughs> Matthew 24 is difficult to understand. Um, so, uh, so anyway, that's what we're doing. We're reading from verse to verse and um, trying to understand what is the original intended meaning behind each verse and behind the words of Christ behind all the words of Scripture. So we're looking at verses 15 to uh, 28 this morning, and of course you see this uh, great uh, title, The Abomination of Desolation. What is that all about? <clears throat> so reading from verse 1 uh, here, and then uh, there's another screen. <clears throat> verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, and it seems to me here that this is Matthew adding this portion, let the reader understand. <clears throat> then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the housetop must not go down to get the things out that are, are in his house. And whoever is in the field must not go back to get his garment. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. But pray that your flight may, will not be in the winter or on a Sabbath, for then uh, there will be uh, a great tribulation, such as was not has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor uh, ever will. Verse 22, And unless those days had been cut short, uh, no life uh, would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be sh cut short. And if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance. Therefore, if they say to you, Behold, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. Or behold, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe them. For just as the lightning comes from the east and appears even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. So this morning we will... Uh, study from verse 15 to verse 25 and verse 26 and onward. The Lord willing, we will look at those verses uh, next week. So let's pray before we get to the Word of God. Lord, thank you again for the words of Christ. And Lord, I am always, um, I feel so unworthy. Uh, Lord, as I come uh, to the text and to preach the text, because I acknowledge that I am a sinner. And also, who am I, Lord, to try and say, this is what Jesus is saying. Uh, Lord, I know that um, uh, you know that I have done my, my very best to try to understand these words, and uh, I'm accountable to you. And I pray, the Lord, that you would use these words spoken today, that uh, you would use it for your honor and for your glory, and remind us of what is found in Scripture. And uh, Lord, we really want to know what is found in Scripture and what was the original intended meaning behind each word, each verse that is found in Scripture. So now, Lord, we pray for your blessing as we look into your word. May your spirit be our teacher, and may your spirit be our guide. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we near the end of the Gospel of, of Matthew, yes, we are nearing the end of the Gospel of Matthew. We are in Matthew chapter 24. There are 28 chapters in the Gospel of Matthew. Now we're getting beyond chapter 25. We're getting into the very um, the account of Jesus' uh, betrayal, death, burial, and resurrection. And so there's a lot there a lot of important uh, teaching there. And so we will take our time to go through those portions. And so as we near the uh, end of the Gospel of Matthew, we're reminded that our Lord is arriving uh, to the end of his earthly ministry. His earthly ministry because beyond his 
return to heaven, Christ continues to minister. But here we see in Matthew 24, this is a record of his earthly ministry. And we know that there was a 400-year silence between the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, and also the return of, uh, or not the return, the coming of John the Baptist. It was a 400 years of silence, more or less. And, and with John the Baptist arriving, <clears throat> and uh, he was the forerunner of Christ, as he was the last prophet of the Old Testament, uh, with his arrival and message, it announced the end of an era. It really did. Israel was in a state of apostasy. And those who truly believed in those days, they would have been small in number, much like the days of Elijah. Remember Elijah? He says, Lord, I'm the only one. So we thought. And God said, no. There's 7,000. Uh, there's a 7,000 remnant, those who have not bowed the knee to Baal. And so, uh, even in the days of Jesus, the numbers were few. And uh, Israel was in a state of apostasy. And with judgment that came upon the people of Israel in the days of Elijah, we see also a thing in the days of uh, Isaiah, uh, even so with Christ, judgment was coming upon Israel and uh, the end of the Old Covenant, but also it was the beginning of the New Covenant. God was declaring, here's a New Covenant. It was always the plan of God to bring forth a New Covenant. And so the first way, I believe, to interpret this section here in verse 15 and onward, in my opinion, is that the words of Christ apply to the immediate future. So to begin with, it's the immediate future, that is, the uh, in days of the apostles leading up to the, uh, the uh, uh, destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD. But we also have seen that these same words have allusions, from verse 1 to verse 14, have allusions to the far future in the literal end times. We, we looked at this for the past two, three weeks, that from verse 4 approximately until verse 14, we see teachings that can also apply to the end times. Why is that? Well, this is uh, what is known as the prophetic perspective principle, where there's also a dual fulfillment. And so, again, there are allusions to the far future as well, the literal end times. In other words, these verses, verse 4 approximately to verse 14, echo also the actual end times. We looked at that. And so, how to explain the prophetic perspective? Well, um, I learned in seminary uh, a, a, a picture of it, and I don't have, uh, I showed a drawing a few weeks ago, but when I went to Banff, uh, to Cochrane, Alberta, back in 2009, just take a one-year course at a seminary there, um, there, um, I, I could see the mountains, the, the Rocky Mountains, from where I was. And as we got nearer and nearer, we could see the mountains even closer. So, from my perspective, here is one mountain, but, you know, the other mountain was almost like right next to it, from my perspective. But we know the other mountain behind it was like hundreds of miles behind it. And so that's the prophetic perspective, where a prophet, even in the Old Testament, and in the words of Jesus, where he would speak of something in the future, but sometimes it was speaking of the immediate future, but it was also fulfillment in the far-off future. And we see that many times in Scripture. And so this is what we see from verse 1 to verse 14. But now, from verse 15 and onward, it seems very clear to me that Christ is speaking specifically of the immediate future. That is, of the days of the apostles and the days of, uh, of tribulation, where, and we'll get into that uh, shortly, but where the Roman army essentially brought an end to the uh, temple itself. The temple was destroyed, and many other temples uh, buildings in the city of Jerusalem were also destroyed. Uh, here's a quote from what I mentioned about two weeks ago regarding prophetic perspective. <clears throat> he says here in this passage, that is verses 1 to 14, Jesus predicts spe specific events that will occur between, between his resurrection and Rome's sack of Jerusalem in 70 AD. But the same predictions appear to point beyond that period and to describe the days before Christ returns. This makes sense if the fall of Jerusalem foreshadows or prefigures the last day. So this is what the author says. The fall of Jerusalem prefigures or foreshadows the last day. And that's very insightful, I believe. 
Or we could call the fall of Jerusalem a prototype. So the fall of Jerusalem is known as a prototype of the last day. Essentially, he says here, a dress rehearsal. A dress rehearsal, rehearsal uh, resembles a play, yet it is not quite a play. With costumes complete, lines memorized, and the director almost silent, the dress rehearsal is much like the play. So therefore, he says, the fall of Jerusalem was a major event in itself, yet it also rehearses for and foreshadows another event, the last day. So I like these words, and so this is the position I've, I've taken regarding Matthew 24. And so as we return to our text, now we are here in verse 15 and following. It seems uh, evident that these uh, words uh, can and should only apply to those days immediately following the return of Christ uh, to heaven uh, up to 70 AD, the destruction of the temple. Looking at verse 15. Let's go back on, uh, on the screen there. Verse 15. <clears throat> Jesus says, Therefore, why is this therefore, therefore? Well, from what he has said before. Therefore, when, when, not if, when, when you see what? The abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. So, what is this abomination of desolation? Well, the NIV says the abomination that causes desolation. Uh, other translations have basically abomination of desolation. One commentator calls it the, a desolating sacrilege. Now, let's break down those words. Abomination, what does that mean? Well, abomination, first thing that comes to my mind is the abominable snowman. <laughs> so, something that is, a, that is abominable. Well, abomin abomination in the Greek means idolatry. It can mean actually idolatry. And that's interesting. Uh, one of the dictionaries I have for Greek says it's a foul thing, a detestable thing. Uh, another way of see, looking at it, it says uh, of idols, it speaks of idols and things pertaining to idolatry. The English dictionary says basically an abomination is something regarded with disgust or hatred. Desolation. Basically, that's the state of a place that is empty or where everything has been destroyed. Everything has been wiped out. And first thing that comes to mind is the, the two atomic bombs in Japan where everything was wiped out. Desolation, complete desolation. <clears throat> so therefore, whatever it is, abomination of desolation, it sounds terrible. And as we will see, indeed it was. <clears throat> Doriani, uh, the author here, the same author I, I read from before, he says regarding this, this prophecy, this warning, speaks to the fall of Jerusalem, and only the fall of Jerusalem. Its prime commands cannot possibly apply to Jesus' return. And he explains why. Because uh, when, he, when we look at these verses a bit later on, the verses following verse 15, he says, because when he comes, it will be utterly pointless to flee to the mountains. Because he says those words in that passage. So when he comes, why would, he, why would we flee to the mountains? So it doesn't apply. It applies to AD 70. Um, also, he says, uh, Revelation says, unbelievers will wish to be buried under mountains on that day. Why would a believer want to flee anyway? You wouldn't want to flee. Jesus is coming back. It doesn't matter where you are. we will be rejoicing. It says in Scripture, every eye will see him. Um, and how could it be worse for mothers at Christ's return? Or worse if he came on a winter's day? Why? It wouldn't apply. But it is imperative to flee at once because from a vengeful army, the Roman army, when the army comes full of vengeance and fury, flee. And that makes complete sense. Therefore, again, when Christ uh, speaks these words, he is addressing, first of all, his disciples, right? Therefore, he says to them, when you see, when you see, see what? When you see the abomination of desolation occurring, he says, take note of this, for when you see that, it is a clear sign. Remember verse 3? It says, uh, as he, it says here, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. So here the abomination of desolation is a clear sign, an indication of judgment. And as our Lord gives this prophecy, he is foretelling, but he's also giving the prophecy more credibility 
by adding these words here in verse 15. So again, he's adding credibility to these words when you see the abomination of desolation. And he says here, which was spoken of by the prophet Daniel. So what is he doing here? He's saying, Daniel, he's saying, Daniel spoke about this very thing that I'm telling you. Thus, when you actually see this abomination of desolation, be assured that this is exactly what Daniel mentioned many centuries ago. So, it's very important principles here. It's wonderful to see Christ doing this. He's appealing to Scripture. So, Christ, he's appealing to the authority of Scripture. And that's what we need to do. We need to appeal to the authority of Scripture time and time again. Christ also says, it is written, it is written. He teaches us also that in appealing to Daniel, he's saying that Scripture interprets Scripture. It, and he's also connecting verse 15 here of Matthew 24. He's connecting it to Daniel 9, 27, which we'll look at very shortly. And it speaks of the integrity of Scripture. And this is what we need to do as well, to go back to the Scriptures all the time. So we can't just take a verse in isolation. We have to find other passages of Scripture. For example, if we just take one verse of Scripture in the New Testament, uh, where it says in the book of Acts, the baptism of the dead. All scholars today, they, what does that mean? They don't know what it means. Yet one cult, they say, oh, we know what that means. And so they have this strange practice of baptizing the dead. So anyway, we're not going to get into that right now. <laughs> that was a freebie for you. <laughs> um, and so, furthermore, regarding these words of Christ appealing to Daniel, Christ is saying that the Old Testament is fulfilled in the New Testament. And the Old Testament and the New Testament make one complete revelation from the one true God. So, what does it say in Daniel? Let's go to Daniel 9. I don't have it on screen there. But Daniel 9, 25 to 27. Uh, Daniel is right after the book of uh, Ezekiel. And these are prophecies of the, the immediate future. Uh, it says, Now therefore, and understand that from the going out of the world, of the word rather, to restore and build Jerusalem and to, to the coming of an anointed one, that's Jesus, the Messiah, a prince. There shall be seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks it shall be uh, built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. Verse 26, and after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood. And to the end there shall be, uh, uh, be war desolations are decreed. For 27, And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and, soccer, uh, and offering, and on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate. Very interesting. Until the decreed end is poured out in the, the desolator. Verse 30, uh, Daniel 11 now. Uh, no, uh, you might think that I'm going to get into the weeks and, the, and all that. I'm not, I'm not going to get into that this morning <laughs> because I don't think it really uh, 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 is important at this point. Um, verse uh, Daniel 11:31. It says, "Their forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and fortress, and shall take away the regular burnt offering, and they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate." And also in Daniel 12, verse 11, it says here, And from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. So we see here the abomination of desolation mentioned in all these verses. And so it speaks of the future, the immediate future. So now we'll get into what, it's, what we, we believe, or what I believe is actually saying. Verse 15 again, Matthew 24, verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, and he says here, standing in the holy place. What does that mean? And the big question, what is it exactly is this referring to? What is the abomination of desolation? And what does it mean standing in the holy place? Well, interestingly, this expression, abomination of desolation, is also mentioned in 1 Maccabees, 157. Don't open your Bibles, it's not there. <laughs> First Maccabees is a extra biblical literature uh, between the two testaments, between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It was written around 160 BC, 168 years approximately before 
uh, Christ. Uh, so, but it's, this is mentioned here. So, uh, 1 Maccabees 157, it says, On the 15th, 15th, sorry, 15th day of the month of Kasliu, in the 145th year, King Antiochus, he was the Greek king during the Greek Empire. So when uh, Alexander the Great died, uh, the um, kingdom was split up into three or four. Uh, his generals, it was four, okay, four, thank you. Um, and so Antiochus was one of them. Uh, and uh, he was the king at that time of that area where, where he was in Israel. And um, um, so King Antiochus set up the abomination idol of desolation upon the altar of God. So this is a historical record of what happened, and they called it an abomination, the abomination idol of desolation. Now here, I also when I clicked on this on my computer, uh, on my computer software, it opened up a, a, a book that I didn't know I had in my Bible software, and it's a commentary on First Maccabees. I didn't know such thing, such a thing existed. And so here's a commentary, a, an explanation of, of that passage in First Maccabees 1.57. Uh, it was to the Jews an abomination which arose out of desolation, or more probably one that caused it, especially a desolation of all holy ideas and usages in connection with the temple and its service. That's around 168 BC. And so we're going to go a bit deeper in what uh, some Christian scholars are saying here. So without going into great, too many great details here, our Lord was referring to, to what was prophesied in the book of Daniel, but he also would have known what occurred in 168 BC. He would have known about that. And so in Daniel 11, 31, Again, we saw that uh, earlier. It says here, forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and fortress and shall take away the regular burnt offering and they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. Don Carson, a Christian scholar that we, that's still around today, we know him, I met him, um, says about this passage, he says this passage, it clearly refers to the, des the desecration under Antiochus uh, the fourth. Uh, who erected an altar to Zeus over the altar of burnt offering in the temple, sacrificed a swine, a pig, on it, and made the practice of Judaism a capital offense. Mm -hmm. And so what he did in 168 BC, Antiochus, was an abomination. You know, imagine for the Jew, you know, because the, <laughs> uh, the pig was a, uh, is an unclean animal. To have a pig sacrifice over the altar of sacrifice in the tabernacle, that would have been, a, it's an abomination, it's scandalous, it's, it's, uh, and so this definitely was, is what one of the things that has been, is being referred to. So this act of offering a pig, apparently there were many uh, swine, many uh, pigs that were sacrificed in the Jewish temple, right over the altar of burnt offering would have been an abomination. Now fast forward 200 years later to the days before 70 A.D. <clears throat> and our Lord is clearly saying, in verse 15, that there will be another abomination of desolation, aside from the one in 168 B.C. Um, now, Matthew 24, and also in Luke 21, that's the parallel account where Christ is teaching the same thing. He's teaching the same thing. And verse, uh, Luke 21, verse 20, Jesus adds, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, he's making it very clear. So, this is spe specifically speaking about 70 AD and the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. So, here's a couple of quotes I found that are really good. So, regarding a topic like this, I, I can't make this stuff up. I can't invent. I have to, to stand on the shoulders of others who have done the work and that's why I'm, I'm doing a lot of quoting here, um, and uh, really, it's really helpful. So the difference here is not so great as it seems. For the Roman army is, according to this one author, is the abomination that causes desolation. The Roman army itself in 70 AD, they, they were an abomination because the army carried images essential to emperor worship, idols in tow. They besieged the city. They starved the people. They breached the walls, they torched the city, they smashed the, te smashed the temple, and pagans entering and defiling the temple, and they slaughtered the innocent 
the, and, and also combatants alike, that is, those who were fighting against the Romans. Another quote uh, says here, uh, the Jewish historian Josephus claimed that 1.1 million people, most of them Jewish, were killed during the siege. How many times have we seen people, 1.1 million people dying in one instant or one event? Uh, so, um, as, so that the bodies were literally piled up around the altar. The usual population of Jerusalem was likely enlarged given the fact that they had come to the city to celebrate the Passover. Imagine that, going, coming to the Passover, and now you end up dead. Or you, you see a slaughter, um, which was to occur right at the siege, uh, as the siege was being launched. Prior to the siege, the Romans had allowed Jewish worshippers to enter the city for the feast, but they did not allow them to leave. So, looking at all of this, and I didn't know a lot of this information until uh, many days ago when I was preparing here for this, it's, uh, it was really an abomination, truly horrible, horrible time for the Jewish people. Thus we can see that these words of Christ should only apply to this time leading up to 70 AD and 70 AD itself. When, when, the, temp, when the temple was destroyed, it was an act of God. I mentioned this before. Because uh, God was allowing, was ordaining the end of the Old Testament sacrificial system. And because all the sacrifices were fulfilled in Christ. Remember, they rejected Christ. Remember when, in, uh, when Christ was before Pilate, um, the, uh, the Jewish leaders, they said, crucify him, crucify him. Mm -hmm. And they said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. So God brought judgment upon people of Israel and many times in the Old Testament. And thus, God was doing the same here. And God, and I believe, and I've said this many times, God was burning the bridge to the temple. You are not to go back there. The, sacri the sacrifices of the Old Testament were fulfilled in the one person, my son, and you're not to go back there. You're not to offer any more sacrifices because it, is, it would be blasphemous in the mind of mind and heart of God. So a lot more information that we can say about this, but we, I, I have a better understanding about the abomination of desolation now than I never had than I've ever had. So moving on to verse 16 and following, just move quick, more quickly through this, because here we see descriptions about the actual event of uh, 70 AD. Verse 16, G Jesus says, Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Flee, run. When you see the, the Roman soldiers coming to, uh, to circle the city of Jerusalem, flee to the mountains. If these words... Uh, would apply to the end times, why would Christians flee to the mountains knowing that Jesus is coming back? It doesn't make any sense. So flee to the mountains because the Roman army is coming or you might get killed in the crossfire. Verse 17 to 19. So Jesus says, whoever is on the housetop, if you're, you know, because houses were flat there and we're all connected next to each other, uh, whoever's on the housetop must not go down to get the things that are in this house. Don't worry about your stuff. <laughs> Run. Run for your life. Uh, verse 18, whoever's in the field must not go back to get his garment. Don't go back to your house. If you're in the field, you know, uh, bringing in the crops or whatever, don't go back to your house. Verse 19, but both of those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. So here's a good uh, explanation, a good commentary on this. The instructions Jesus gives his disciples about what to do is in, in view of verse 15, the abomination of desolation, are so specific that they must be related to the Jewish war. And it can only be related to the Jewish war. The devastation would stretch for far beyond the city. People throughout Judea would flee to the mountains, where the Maccabeans, those who were in, uh, had rebelled against the Roman, uh, Roman army and so forth, um, uh, where they had hidden in caves. In other words, go to the mountains where there's caves where people previously had, uh, had hidden themselves. Uh, most roofs regarding the roofs were flat. Uh, pleasant places in the cool of the day, and verse 17 implies uh, such haste that fugitives will not take time to run downstairs for anything to take with them, but will run from roof to roof to evacuate the city as quickly as possible. And that makes sense, right? Now, you're on the roof, don't go back downstairs, uh, down, just run from house to house on the rooftop till you, you can escape. Uh, people in the fields will not have time to go home for their cloaks. It will be especially dreadful for pregnant women and nursing mothers, and we can understand that. It's extremely complicated for them. 
Verse 20, but pray that your flight will not be in winter or on the Sabbath. What does that mean? Well, flight is obviously harder in winter. Now, they don't have winters like we do here. <laughs> um, but obviously, in wintertime, it's colder and it's harder uh, to, to move around. And for fleeing on the Sabbath, I never knew before what, what, what is meant by that. Well, he says uh, here that travel would become more difficult because few would help and many would try to prevent traveling farther than a Sabbath day journey. And so even in, in that time, there would be those who were uh, holding to the strict rules and strict, law, strict laws of the Sabbath and say, no, 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 you can't flee uh, beyond a mile or whatever. Well, <laughs> uh, that's um, legalism, really. But uh, here, Jesus is explaining this is what the situation will be for you. Uh, so pray that it's not on the Sabbath itself. So clearly, Jesus clearly expects these events to take place while the strict Sabbath laws are in effect, and they were at that time. Verse 21, Jesus says, For there, then there will be a, a great tribulation, such as uh, has not occurred since the beginning of the, and I put under brackets, known world until now, nor ever will. So um, this was the known world. And so obviously it speaks of the known world of, of, uh, of the days of the apostles. They didn't know what was going on in North America and South America. They didn't know those, those continents existed. Here's a quote again. It says, The savagery is slaughter, disease, and famine. And it says here, Mothers eating their own children were monstrous. This is from Josephus, uh, chapter 4. Um, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and according to Jesus, never to be equaled again. There have been greater numbers of deaths, but never so high a percentage of the great city's population so thoroughly and painfully exterminated and enslaved as during the fall of Jerusalem. Verse 22. And unless those days had been, been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. We saw in verse 15. Again, therefore, when you see the, the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through the, the Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place. The holy place is basically the whole area of the temple. Um, let the reader understand. Basically, it means that those who read Matthew had to be ready to act, ready to flee the believers. And they would be ready to flee when the Romans came. The Christians did flee, according to this one source. They did flee at that time so that many lives were spared. When the Romans fell upon Jerusalem, the church at Jerusalem, here's a quote from this uh, one source, the church at Jerusalem left the city and moved to a town called Pella. And I didn't know that. And I'd like to uh, see what that is on the map. But anyway, so this is what happened. And so here when Christ says uh, to flee, these are the gracious words of Christ. He's telling, save yourselves. Save yourselves and as many as you can bring them with you, and flee to the mountains, and so forth. Verse 23 to 25, Christ uh, uh, continues here. Then if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets have uh, will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So uh, I'll, I may spend more time on this next week, but we see here, even in this crisis, some would arise giving the Christians a false hope. Uh, here is the Christ. Don't believe them. Don't believe them. And Christ is saying, listen to my words. Flee. Don't listen to anyone who's making the claim of giving you a hope that they, maybe they're, they're a Messiah, they're, 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 they're sent by God, follow me, and so forth. And Christ continues, he says here, Behold, I have told you in advance. I've warned you. And these are written in Scripture. So, just to bring this to a close here this morning, as I meditated on this passage this past week, I'm reminded of how horrible it would have been for anyone in those days. It would have been a horrible, horrible situation. Far more horrible than I thought as I was uh, uh, finding these sources that explained exactly what was going on. And for our brothers and sisters in Christ, they were our brothers and sisters in Christ. Many of them fled, many of them died as a process of this. 70 AD was part of God's judgment where he used the Romans as a sword in his hand to punish unbelieving Israel, for God was punishing the unrepentant Jews, and secondly, he was also bringing in the new covenant, which he had promised back in the Old Testament. Now the people of God are those who are in Christ, 
It's not a people. Who are, where, who are the Christians? Where are the Christians? It's anyone and everyone. It could be a Jew, it could be a Gentile, it could be anyone. And so here we see that we are in the new covenant. So the abomination of desolation was a horrible event in the, in the last days of the Jews, or in the days of the Jews, a horrendous, horrendous number of Jews perished. It reminds me of Christ's words in Luke 13 and following, verse 1. It says here, there were some uh, present at that very time who told them about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifice. And he answered them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they were suffered in this way? No, I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Verse 4, are, are those 18 on whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed them? Do you think that they were worse uh, offenders than those than the others who lived in Jerusalem? And Christ says again, No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Calamities will come, trials will come, tribulations will come, wars will come, and, uh, and it, it happens on the just and the unjust. None of us know when calamities may happen. And we think of World War I, we think of World War II, it's beyond uh, any of us here. Uh, to someone here <laughs> that lived, that was alive during the uh, Second World War. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, we, these, things, these things happen. It's part of what uh, it is to live in a fallen world. And uh, nor do we know when God's judgment may come. And so it's a reminder here to wake up. Mm -hmm. For the world to wake up, for all people to wake up, for all generations to wake up, for the, for the people of Israel in, the, in that time to wake up, to repent, and to acknowledge that, yes, they crucified the Lord of glory, and for people to repent and to get right with God. So all of this is a reminder for all of us to get right with God. Again, our sign on side says, Jesus is coming back. Are you ready? And I probably say this every, every Sunday until I'm done in this series of the uh, Matthew 24 and Matthew 25. What does it mean to be ready? How are you ready? Well, you're ready when you have come to faith in Christ, when you're born again in the Spirit of God, when the blood of Christ has been applied to your heart and you've been transformed and you're now a Christian and you're, now you have a right standing before God. Are you ready? I am ready. I am ready. I've been ready for 40 years. I don't know when Christ is returning, but I am ready because of the grace of God and nothing because of what uh, I've done. And so I just want to end with these words. Christ appeals to all. And so as we think of this abomination of desolation, it's a horrible thing. Uh, will there be a future abomination of desolation? Well, I, I, don't, I don't think so. I think that's based, basically, I think it is based on a, a rebuilding of the temple, which I don't believe is biblical. But regardless of that, uh, I, 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 you know, we should just take what, what is, has been said today for what it is. Um, but um, we do know Christ is coming back, and we are the temple, the Christians. The Christ is the temple, and we are part of that temple together. So there's no building and so, which is something that's greater than what we saw in the Old Testament and in the days of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, if Jesus is coming back, are you ready? Look at the words of Christ. Jesus says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I'm the one that's going to give you that rest. Not the church, but I, my person, I will give you that rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And when I, before I became a Christian, I thought this religion thing was, was going to be like a weight upon me. It's like, oh no, I'm going to, I can't do this, I can't do that, I can't have fun. You know, I'll just be miserable the rest, all the days of my life. No, Christ is saying, my, my, my yoke is easy. I am gentle, I am lowly in heart. And you will, find, you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So Jesus says, come to me. Come as you are. Come in your filth, and he will wash you, and he will cleanse you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the words of Christ. And Lord, the words of Christ are so profound. Lord, may you continue to speak to us, Lord, in the days and weeks to come. Thank you, Lord, for the words of Christ. For we know that judgment came upon Israel because of their unbelief, because of their rebellion. And Lord, we pray for our generation now. Our nation has abandoned you. Many nations of the, of the world Lord, once at one point uh, honored you and exalted you. Now it is trampling over the name of Christ. We pray, Lord, for the nations to repent, that they would come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. Bless each one here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.